Hello everyone, this is Nate from Chaos and I'd like to welcome you to this tutorial series here. Throughout this series, we'll be creating this ArcVis inspired render that you see in front of you. And as you can imagine, we'll be using V-Ray to render things out. The whole idea behind this series is to go on a rendering journey with you and along the way, demo the workflow of working with V-Ray. Now we're going to be starting the series with a simple modeling time lapse, just so you get some context about the scene we'll be working with. Then we'll be setting up the lighting in the scene because hey, if there's no light, there's nothing to see, right? Nothing to render. <laughs> All right. And then uh, we'll use the VFB to tone map the image. That's definitely an important part of everyone's workflow. And what is also important is to have materials in your scenes. Otherwise, everything will be just that default white material. So yes, we'll also be creating materials in this one. Now, to make our lives easier, we'll also be using Chaos Cosmos to bring in some of the 3D assets as well. And we'll also play around with the V-Ray fur object to create that rug. And that's without using cloners, mind you, or anything like that, because, you know, the V-Ray fur object is really powerful. Okay, and so right at the end there, we'll also talk render settings. Not that they are that important with these newer versions of V-Ray, but you know, it's always good to know how to extra optimize your renders. So as you can see, this series will be all about going from zero to hero, from a simple model to a fully fleshed out render, and we'll cover every single step in that process. All right, so enough with the intro, let's get to work. So what we'll be doing in this video is we'll be setting up our scene. So we won't be doing any V-Ray related stuff. It's just a good old plain modeling time lapse that you'll be seeing here. So just something, you know, to get us started and so that we have some context about what kind of scene we'll be working with here. Now, as almost every other modeling job, this one will also start with us placing in a plane which will serve as our starting point. Then, obviously, You'll see me resize the thing until I kind of think it's in the shape of this elongated corridor, if you will. And with that done, I'll be bringing in our hero object, the sofa. Now, you know, it's you think it's still a bit early to be bringing in actual models, but since the sofa is the hero object, well, we can already place it in here so that we get a better sense of scale, right? Right. Okay, next thing on the to-do list here, uh, will be to rename the plane mesh here to, well, mesh. And it obviously totally depends on your organizational preferences, on how you name things. And so, you know, this is just how I like to name things. And then what you'll see me do is I'll duplicate the mesh and turn the previous one off and just nest both objects under a null I'm calling architecture. And the reasoning here is that this way, we'll always be able to go back to the previous state of our mesh if need be, because we'll be making copies of it each time we make a bigger modeling change to it. Now this way, if we do something stupid, like model something wrong, we can always go back to the previous object and redo things instead of, you know, having to start from complete scratch. All right. Now, is this the go-to workflow for every project? Probably not, but Again, it's a bit of a preference of mine, and hopefully it'll be of help to you as well, <laughs> because anything's better than starting a modeling process from scratch, right? Okay, next up, time to start doing some cutting for the walls. And so we'll create some insets on our plane, and then we'll also create a loop cut down the middle, which will bevel so that its thickness matches the other insets. Then it's extruding time because, you know, Walls typically have height to them. Otherwise, they'd be just uh, floors, I guess. Okay, so after doing that, it's time to inspect the model. And so far, it all looks good. Now, before we make changes to what we've created here, we're going to again duplicate the mesh slash object we're working on and make the previous one hidden. You know, just in case we need to revert back to the previous state. Okay, so with that done, we can start drilling a hole through that middle wall. And for that, we'll use a cylinder object. Now, at this point, we should mention that we'll cut the hole through the middle wall using Boolean operations. And if you've ever used Booleans, well, they tend to work great, but the geometry they generate isn't that fly. It isn't that good. 
but because this is a simpler scene, we'll get away with it. So we'll just bool cut this thing, okay? But, you know, first we need to make sure everything is aligned properly and the cylinder used for the bool has enough segments on it so that it isn't too low poly. Now, after slight pause for dramatic effect, the booling happens, you'll see that we'll need to split the floor from the walls. Otherwise, we're also going to be cutting a hole into the floor, as you can see. That said, when modeling realistic interiors, you'll almost always have some sort of skirting done where the walls meet the floors. And so typically, I personally split the walls from the floor very early on for those kinds of projects, okay? Typically, right after I've made the insets for the walls. But in this case, I haven't because we won't have any skirting and we'll see the floor connect with the walls. And that's going to be important for us because we will definitely want those connecting edges there to be beveled. But, you know, more on that later on. For now, we'll just split the floor from the walls, okay? Okay, now, before we do the actual splitting, We'll also nest everything under a null, which we'll name mesh.2, so it makes organizational sense here. And then the floor deleting will happen. Okay, looking good so far. So now we'll drop in a camera. We'll reset its rotation and X position so that it's facing straight ahead. And we'll set its focal length to be about 60 millimeters. And then it's just a matter of positioning the camera the way we want it to be. So just some position fiddling here, but ultimately, once we're happy with the camera's position itself, we'll just slap a protection tag on it, which will lock the camera's position so we don't accidentally end up moving it later on. Now, to make our lives easier, we'll set up another viewport to be our modeling viewport, okay? So this way, we'll be able to switch between being in our main camera, the one that we just set up, and our quote unquote, modeling camera, okay? So we'll be able to switch really quickly between the two here because it'll only be a matter of pressing the right viewport shortcut to switch between the two, okay? Instead of having to jump in and out of our main camera. I just find this to be a little bit more straightforward and faster to do. All right, back to modeling. And it's time to adjust the cylinder a bit, you know, to play with how that hole is positioned for a little bit. And then I'm actually going to start moving the position of that middle wall. So maybe the room the sofa is in could be smaller. Okay. And so we can just move the entire wall just like that. No contractor is needed. Modeling is great, isn't it? We will, however, uh, you know, need to make the cylinder a bit longer so that it actually cuts through the wall. But that's easy peasy, ain't it? Okay. So we'll still fiddle around here for a little bit, but you know, we won't be fiddlers on the roof because we're just normal fiddlers. We're modeling fiddlers. Okay. Okay. Next up, we'll duplicate that existing null with the ball, make everything editable, and ultimately collapse it into a single mesh because it'll be easier to work with uh, like that. Okay. All right. So then it's time to finish up that hole in the wall by connecting the two sides of it together. So we'll use the path selection tool, and then we'll just stitch and sew the two sides together and that's done. And now it's time to inspect the mesh a little bit here. If everything's looking like it should be. And then, you know, again, the usual copy the object, just in case we'll want to go back to this state later on. Next up are the window openings and to get them going, we'll just do some random cuts. You know, we don't have any specific measurements in mind here. We're just doing something that we think will look good. Ultimately we'll always have the ability to resize these windows anyway. All right. Okay. So next up, just some cutting holes and <laughs> creating windows. It's all pretty straightforward. You just make a couple of cuts, you know, and then you start deleting the geometry between those cuts. All really straightforward, basic knowledge. Now you'll notice a small pause here and some cutting holes and then undoing those cuts. Well, it's just, you know, that creative process where you're wondering if maybe that wall could maybe stay intact, you know, just because otherwise we'll have too much light in here. Okay. So some doing and then undoing is happening here. Totally creative. <laughs> okay. 
But, you know, once the holes are done, we need to bridge the outer faces with the inner ones. And voila, we have our side windows. Okay, so the architecture, if you will, kind of looks good already. Now, at this stage, we'll bring in one of the main elements in the scene, not a hero element, but an important element nonetheless, that plant wall. So we'll just import that into the scene and position it to where we want it to be. All right, then as one of the last adjustments to our scene here, we'll create an indent for that plant wall so that it's kind of housed inside the walls themselves. All right, so to do that, we'll just do some cutting magic again, just trying to make the cuts fit the width of our plant wall. And then, you know, we'll extrude the thing inwards. With that done, we can position the plant wall in its place and we're basically done. I mean, we're good sports here. What we should also do is we could finalize the geometry here a bit so we don't get that vertical indent above the plant wall. Although I doubt anyone will see it because of our camera angle, but hey, sometimes you just want to model stuff a bit more precisely, a bit more professionally. <laughs> Am I right? Okay. Yeah, uh, we, we will also make that back wall just a bit thicker there too, just so that we don't get the plant wall clipping into the actual wall all hardcore like that. Okay. Okay then. So we can finalize things here, I think. Uh, we'll create a simple floor for our interior here. And we can create it by simply capping that hole where the floor was at. And if you'll remember, we'll want the floor to be one with the walls because we'll bevel slash round those edges where the floor meets the walls, okay? It'll look way more realistic this way. Because, you know, every edge in your scene should be beveled slash rounded because it will just look more realistic that way as it'll be able to catch those nice realistic highlights if it's beveled. Also, don't forget to turn on Fong Break Rounding in the Bevel Deformer. That one is super important because it'll treat the floor and gone as a flat surface then, instead of treating the walls and the floor as sort of this round object, okay? All right, so then we'll also need the ceiling. And to get that going, we'll actually go back to our Mesh.1 object because we know it's pretty much of perfect measurements for our ceiling. Copy it, nest it in a null, and call the null ceiling. Then we'll do some extra organizing here and ultimately move that ceiling mesh to be positioned on top of those walls, like a ceiling would be. And just to make sure we don't run into any light leaking problems, let's make the ceiling a bit more realistic and give it some thickness with the help of the cloth generator. And with that, we are done here. Our scene is set up. Don't forget to save though, and actually save more often than what you were able to observe here because saving can save you a ton of time in case anything crashes. But yeah, again, we're sort of done here. Our scene is set up, although of course we'll still probably tweak it and all, but the base setup is there. And now we can start thinking about the lighting. So this is where we'll conclude this video and we'll invite you to watch the next one. Again. This one was a bit of a breeze through the modeling stages. You know, we didn't really stop and go into the details of what we're doing because, well, it's all more or less just basic modeling. In the next video, we'll focus on setting up a basic lighting scenario with V-Ray, of course, and we'll also do some basic tone mapping. We'll slow it down. Okay, no more time lapses. And so we'll really be creating in real time, basically. It's going to be an exciting one and we'll see you there.